Welcome everyone to tonight's Mission Control, Thursday, December 14th. We got some special guests tonight, and thanks for all the attendees for joining us once again. Um, with this Mission Control is going to reach out hundreds of people, which we send out on our YouTube page, and we'll be recording it for further purposes. So starting off uh, with our rules of engagement for tonight's Mission Control, like we do for everyone, um, we want to make sure everybody treats each other with dignity and respect. Uh, we'll have a chance to answer questions or ask questions from the panelists, attendees. If you'd like to submit your questions in the chat, we'll get to those as quickly as we can. And um, tonight we're honored to have Mr. Doug Backinger uh, speaking to us about casters as an, er as an ergonomic solutions and material handling. After he's done with his presentation, we'll have a chance for questions both in the in the presentation and at the end, and then we'll have a few words from uh, Steve. And uh, now we'll go ahead and I'll stop sharing my screen and pass it on to Mr. Duck Backinger if you want to give us a quick intro about yourself and then get on to your presentation. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Steve. I uh, appreciate the invite. Um, so my name is Doug Backinger. I'm the Vice President of Sales at Caster Concepts. Um, I got a slide in my presentation where I kind of give some more background. Um, but essentially, I've been in the caster industry since I've graduated college. Uh, when I started here as an intern, uh, I had really no idea what a caster was uh, when I walked in the door. But now I've uh, been fortunate enough to design a lot of casters, test a lot of casters, and be out in the field to solve a lot of problems. Awesome. Works out for your presentation. Yeah, thanks. Can you see it okay? Yep, I can see it. You want to go to present mode, that works too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. You see present mode? Uh, not yet. How about now? There we go. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So, like Ray said in the introduction, what I'm going to be talking about today is the importance of casters and the impact they can play on material handling uh, in terms of improving ergonomics. So, a little bit about caster concepts. So, we've been in business now for about 40 years. Uh, located in Elvian, Michigan. Uh, that's where our factory's at. Uh, we make everything within these walls, and uh, we're proud to say that we're made in Michigan and made in the USA. And really, our, our niche in the, the caster world is solving difficult material handling problems. So like Steve alluded to earlier, casters are on tons of different things, uh, but we're specializing more in industrial applications say 500 pounds up to, you know, 200,000 pounds. And we don't necessarily specialize in like off the shelf solutions. It's more, we go and evaluate what's going on and tailor a solution to you. And like I said earlier, so I've been with the company uh, 17 plus years. I started as an engineer. So I spent my first half of the career doing product design, testing, uh, got to move into operations, so you learned how everything was made, and then the last four years now, uh, I've been leading the sales team. So, well, I assume everybody here knows what ergonomics is. Start with a quick definition. So this is from the Material Handling Institute. Ergonomics is the science that seeks to adapt work or working conditions to suit the abilities of the worker. They also have a list of 10 principles. So we just highlighted two important ones to us and that uh, equipment should be selected that eliminates repetitive and strenuous manual labor. And the material handling equipment uh, should be designed so it's safe for people to use. Now, the problem with casters is usually it's the last thing people think about. So they have their cart, they have their dolly, they have whatever they're, they're trying to move. They put casters on the bottom and then it doesn't work the way they want it to work. So 
So why, why are more and more companies talking about ergonomics? You, know, you can do a Google search. You can get all sorts of different numbers on overexertion injuries. Uh, the main point is it costs companies a lot of money every year. And from what we see, we think it's only going to get worse. So with the move to electric vehicles, what we're seeing is uh, parts are getting heavier, the batteries are heavier, and where an automotive facility used to be able to get away with a bunch of carts that weighed, you know, 1,000 pounds, 1,200 pounds, now we're seeing carts that weigh 2,000, 2,500, 3,000 pounds, and they can't exactly go out and hire a bunch more people to move it, so they're trying to find solutions to be able to move that type of weight safely with one person. And what I want to educate people on today is a lot of those problems can be solved just by using the right caster. So what we typically see in industry is companies come up with some sort of safety standard on push forces. So where a lot of these have come from, uh, Liberty Mutual back in, I think the 70s, uh, developed this risk table. Uh, some people might know them as the snook tables. And basically what it does is you put in uh, a force, a push force that somebody is going to do multiple times a day, and it will tell you basically how safe that is as a percentage of the population. So, for example, you have something that takes 70 pounds to push. That's only going to be safe for about 38% of the population, which, so for every 100 employees you have, 62 are at potential risk of injury. So you can see if you can reduce that to 50 pounds, you have a big jump in the percentage that that's safe for. So now you're up to 82%. And the main standard we see in industry, I'd say probably 80, 85% of companies are somewhere in the 40 pound range, some 45, some 35, but that gets you to 90% plus. So the tables don't say anything's 100%, but it will say 90% plus, and that's the best the table will give you. So that's the main standard that we're seeing in, in industry. So depending on you know, whether you have 1,000 pounds or 3,000 pounds, you need it to be 40 pounds or less to start moving as a max force. So what I want to educate people on is how can you choose a caster to be able to help you get to that 40 pound number? And the things I'm going to talk about tonight, so the, the caster rig itself, so there's a couple important features. The, uh, the wheel design, the actual wheel material or the tread, and then once you have all that, how do you put it on your cart? So with the caster rig, there's really two main things we're looking at. And the first one is the swivel section design. So that's the, the rotating, the bearing element that allows the caster to swivel or pivot. And then the swivel lead or swivel offset. So that, if you look at the center line for where the caster pivots, that's the distance between that center line and then where the wheel is located. And you need to optimize one before you can optimize the other. So with the, the swivel section, kind of the original caster technology was a kingpin style caster. So if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's and you're going to buy a caster, this is the type you're going to see. You know, they're typically made from, you know, stamped components or sometimes a forging that's been heat treated. But essentially, they have a, a central kingpin that you then fasten with a nut or some sort of staking or uh, swedging operation to hold everything together. So the drawback to that is, one, if you're using the, the nut to, to tighten everything together, you're putting drag on that swivel section, which makes it harder to rotate. And then just in terms of manufacturability, you're using some form of steel that can be welded. And really, if you want the best bearing element, you want the high-grade steel that's been heat treated and that's been manufactured in a very precise manner to remove any sort of the slop or play that might load it unevenly. So with this design, you know, it's easy to produce, but you're giving up a lot in terms of how it moves. So in the 70s, uh, this kingpinless style came out. So this got rid of the kingpin, uh, but still kind of similar drawbacks. You're, you're manufacturing your own bearing element. 
you have to choose a steel that can be welded. So you can't quite heat treat it to the degree that you would if you went out and bought, you know, an off the shelf ball bearing or tapered bearing. So while this was an improvement over the kingpin, you know, there was still some room to advance here in terms of uh, tool section design. So what's been around the last 15, 20 years or so is this maintenance free design. So that uses a totally separate bearing element. Uh, in this case, it's a, a sealed ball bearing. So now you can optimize the steel you wanna use, you can optimize the heat treat, and instead of having to weld it to your fork, you can press it all together. And now you've kind of optimized the swivel section design in terms of uh, a, a precise bearing element. So these things are manufactured to 10 thousandths of an inch. They use bearing grade steel and they heat treat it to you know, somewhere in the 55 to 60 Rockwell C range. So now you're spreading out that load more evenly, uh, you have a better wear surface, and you get a swivel section that rotates much easier under load. So the one drawback would be is as you scale this up to larger sizes, those bearings get much more expensive, and usually it becomes more cost efficient to use, say, a king pinless style. So now that we've talked about the swivel section, the next thing you need to optimize is the, the swivel lead. So the general rule of thumb is the longer that swivel lead is, or the further that wheel is away from the center of pivot, the easier that caster is going to swivel. So think about if you had a lever, you know, it's simple mechanical advantage. If I have a longer lever, I'm going to be able to turn something much easier than if I have a short lever. Same principle applies here, but in this case, there, there's an optimal swivel lead. So the problem with extending that lead out is now you're putting you know, a greater moment arm on this swivel section. So as you extend that out, you're putting more and more stress on the swivel section, which then makes it harder to swivel. So what we found in our testing is there's an optimal swivel lead that you want for the caster that you have, the swivel section that you have. And if you go beyond that, then performance drops off very rapidly. Next, your wheel design. So the first one's pretty obvious. So with wheel diameter, the larger the wheel, the easier it's gonna roll. There's formulas you know, out there that you can calculate real quickly that if I go to a eight inch wheel versus a six inch wheel, it's something like 25 or 30% easier to roll. But the downside to that is you might be saying, well, I'll just use the biggest wheel I can. You know, I will go to a 24 inch wheel. In this case, you know, we're talking about carts that people are pushing, that people are working off of, and people have an average height. So to keep things still in an ergonomic position, you're kind of limited on how large of a wheel you can use. So even though bigger is better, it doesn't necessarily always mean that it's the best solution overall. The next part of the wheel that I'll talk about is the wheel width. So th this one's a little confusing because if you're talking about just getting a wheel to start rolling, the wider the wheel, the better. And I'll, I'll kind of illustrate this here on this image. So if you look at this red wheel here and say that's a wide wheel, you know, it's flat face, the entire surface is in contact. And then you look at this green wheel that's balloon tread, uh, that would match it more to this image on the right for the narrow wheel because you have a much smaller contact patch. So or not smaller contact patch, um, you have less surface in contact. So then you have more stress on that area, which then you now have a larger contact patch. So ideally you want that height of that contact patch to be as narrow as possible to get that wheel to start rolling as easy as possible. So it's kind of the same thing. You're limiting the, the, the lever arm that you got to get over to start rolling. The downside to going to a wide wheel is your maximum push force actually happens when your swivel casters rotate around. The wider that wheel is, when that caster starts to swivel, the inside part of the wheel and the outside part of the wheel wanna rotate at different rates. So basically you then have to fight the friction of that wheel trying to scrub against the ground as the caster swivels. So wide wheels don't work real great in a swivel caster application because that scrubbing force is so much greater. 
So that's where in the industry, you'll really see a lot of balloon tread wheels as ergonomic wheels, because even though that contact patch uh, has a higher height, you know, so it makes it harder to start rolling, it has less scrubbing. So in the caster swivels, it, it ends up being a better solution. Which then leads me into the wheel style. So, you know, you have these flat tread wheels, you have round tread wheels, and then in the last, say, 10, 15 years, you've seen more split tread wheels. Those split tread wheels allow you to take advantage of wider wheels and then reduce the amount of scrubbing because now you can stack these individual rotating discs together. So then as that caster swivels around, each of those discs can rotate at a different rate and really reduce the amount of scrubbing. So that pretty much covers it for the main types of wheels that you're going to see out there. Next, uh, wheel material or the tread material. So again, it, it's all about trade-offs. And, you know, we like to say this one's the Goldilocks principle. You know, you can't be too hard. You can't be too soft. You got to be just right. Now, ideally, the harder the wheel, the easier it's going to roll. The problem with that Say I went out and got a steel wheel, I heat treated it as hard as I could, and that's going to make it really easy to roll. The drawback is I'm going to tear up my floors. So then I'm going to have a cost of repairing my floor every year, or six months or something like that, and just have this tremendous cost. So then if you go to the opposite side and say, well, I'm going to protect my floors, I'm going to use a really soft rubber wheel. Now the problem is now you have a very large contact patch, you have to fight that scrubbing. So what we find is kind of the ideal solution is this uh, polyurethane tread in the 85 to 95A hardness range. And then even you know, within urethanes, I mean, there's tons of different urethanes with different chemical properties and uh, physical properties where what we're looking for in a urethane is one with high rebound and also high tear strength. So we want something that's very tough. And then the rebound is when it's deformed, how much of that energy does it give back? So think about a, a bouncy ball. When you drop it, how high does it come back up to its original drop point? The higher the rebound, the closer it's going to get back to that original drop point. So now that you know what you're looking for in an ideal caster, how do you put them on your cart? So in this case, what we really see a, a majority in industry is this four-wheel caster steer. So it's two ridges in the back, two swivels in the front. Um, it can be towed around a facility because of the rigid. It has decent maneuverability, so you can't like pivot on center. And because you have casters in all four corners, it's a very stable system. The other style we see a lot is this, uh, this diamond configuration. And there's two types that we see there. So there's one where all four are in contact. So you still have the two swivels in contact, the two rigids in contact. And then the benefit of this is it can pivot on center. So say you need to work off one side of the cart, pivot it around, work off the other side. This is an ideal setup for that. The downside is depending on where your weight is situated, it can be a bit unstable. Say if load gets concentrated in a quarter, you could have a tip hazard. Now, the, the style that actually minimizes push force is this diamond tilt style. So that's where your rigids are slightly taller than your swivels. So then when you start to move it, really the swivels are just acting as uh, tip prevention. And all you need to do is get the rigid or the, the fixed wheels to start rotating. So then you remove any extra, you know, scrubbing or drag from the, the swivel casters and you can really move a lot of weight that way. So now that I've covered that, I'm going to go into a couple of case studies. Any questions so far? Yeah, we can open it up to the panelists. <clears throat> Doug, wouldn't it also be true that on the um, the harder material on the casters are also more prone to picking up debris uh, that yeah, might be yep. on the factory floors? Yep, yep, that 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 is true. So the the harder the wheel, um, like with a like a nylon or some hard plastics. So while they might be easier to roll initially, uh, mm -hmm. what we find is they they tend to pick up debris. 
So because that re they really don't have a lot of rebound, debris will get stuck in there. And while it performed great on day one, by day 50, it's covered in junk and it barely rolls. So that's the other nice thing about urethanes is because of that rebound and some of the properties, they tend to reject debris better. Now, certainly you can get some cheap urethanes that'll act just like a hard plastic, but you know the, the really high quality stuff will reject that debris as well. And then on the flip side of that, if, if you go too soft and the card has got a lot of weight and stays st uh, in a part position, they tend to want to flatten out and cause flat spots in the wheels, yep. which can affect your rolling. So it's very important to, to understand that that load balance for it's not just the turning and the mobility of the car, but how long does it sit still with that weight on it as well? So yep. there's a, definitely a science to it. Do we have any uh, research or do we know like the lifespan difference between the urethane casters versus, you know, hard plastic? Is it one time, two times more? Well, I mean, this is where it gets tough because every application is different, mm -hmm. but where, you know, I mean, it's, you could have a hard plastic wheel and it could pick up debris. And if you don't necessarily care about push forces, I mean, you could just keep using it, right? I mean, you could have yeah. workers struggling. So it could still last a really long time. But in terms of urethane wheels, I mean, we've had urethane wheels in operation for, you know, 10 years and they still look like they're brand new. For sure. Yeah. And if you don't mind, I'll speak to that too. Um, the other issue is when you've got that hard, caster that picks up the debris even if you're not manually moving and it's only being moved by mobile equipment that constant bump 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 will actually start causing the outside of the wheel to separate from the hub and now yep. you're metal on concrete and tears up your concrete floors so it is like you said it's more it's more than just it's a uh, harder to push, but even if you're only pulling it with mobile equipment, it can definitely deteriorate the lifespan. I've, I've seen a brand new uh, caster, you know, put out on the floor and it lasts less than six months and it starts uh, pulling away from the hub. Yeah. Let me, if I, I, I have a question, you know, we're getting ready to, I, uh, one of my jobs is I work in heavy construction. So we're getting ready to put down the the floors needs to be immaculate and needs to stay in shape. It's a uh, it's an epoxy floor, uh, and it you know it's one of the most uh, precision uh, products or processes you you can have. And what from an from that perspective? So you may have something set for two months, but you don't want to scar up these floors because you know we're getting ready to. You know, they're a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Uh, and, you know, we plan all of our work. It is the last thing we do. And, you know, we go into these other hangers and you see them sitting there. What is there an application that's that meets all those needs that you don't want to mark the floor up? You don't want to, you know, that that's something I see literally every every day. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's where uh, this. You know, from a marking standpoint, urethane is usually non-marking. Uh, but where we usually see the issues with marking up epoxy floors is uh, what Dale alluded to with harder wheels picking up debris. Yeah. So they'll pick up debris in another area of the plant. They'll start rolling on these epoxy floors. And next thing you know, you got gouges and cuts and everything else because they got, you know, they're covered in metal shavings. Right. Right. Yeah, that that's uh, and it's odd because uh, as we plan this, we we actually had the the person that's putting it down who owns the epoxy flooring company and uh, and I asked him. I said, "What what kind of casters do you recommend?" And it was just uh, not that we're going to recommend casters to until the the process is up. But the guy didn't know. He he literally so you know. I was thinking, well, what an opportunity, you know, to be of more of a value add to understand that. Well, let me tell you how to take care of this floor because they're walking out, and these things are literally hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know. To oh get sure. And uh, so I didn't mean to didn't mean to run off with that, but I always look at that and I see these beautiful floors with these cuts in them. And, and, you know, it's like Dale said, I, I can see it now, you know, you, you run over a shaving and then thump, 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 thump. It's like that, that grocery cart that you, <laughs> I drew the unlucky grocery cart, bam, bam, bam. 
And so you know, you see it on you know heavy you know heavy equipment, heavy engineering. So uh, yeah, anyway. and and really, I mean, we see this more in aerospace, but a lot of the times we'll be giving we'll be given a max uh, floor stress that we have to design around. So say you know like with the epoxy, how much load can that epoxy actually take? Right. You know, in terms of psi. Right. So if we're given a, a number, we can actually design the, the caster around that number to make sure that it has the correct footprint while still doing things to improve rollability. And it could that a step further, Steve, even if you don't have an expensive floor and it's just a standard concrete floor, most of your large factory floors are just large uh, square slabs that are kind of, you know, married up to each other. Oh, if yeah. you've got too hard of a wheel right there where those concrete slabs connect, it'll start chipping away at those edges. And then before oh, you yeah. know it, you got poor floor conditions. So now you've oh, got the floors tearing up the wheels, the wheels tearing up the floor. Mm -hmm. And you're talking some major dollars when you have to cut an entire section of concrete out, have it re-pour, the amount of downtime, set time. It gets really expensive even on a standard concrete floor. Not careful. Yeah, we we do it all the time. I'm, yeah, I, you're exactly right. And the other thing is, when you chip that out, then the forklift comes down, flying down through there. Now you have a pothole. So you know, it, it literally yep. it's a it's a magnification. But the root cause is downstream, and you had the wrong application with the, you know, for for your environment. So anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead, Doug. I apologize. Yeah. yeah. So I, I have a couple of case studies here where. I show you how we use these different design elements to to create solutions. So the first one, uh, this is a, a tread cart. Um, when we got this, they actually shipped it to us to do some testing. Uh, it weighed 3,500 pounds. Uh, this was a diamond tilt style. And it initially required 200 pounds of force to even get it to move. So we're talking about they were using four people to move this thing. Every, and they're moving these things all over the plant every day. So obviously, I mean, they're looking for a solution, right? They can't have four people moving these things when they have a hundred of them in the facility. So the one thing is we can't switch from the diamond tilt style. In this case, they had a lot of ramps they went up, so they needed that tilt to be able to get up the ramp. So knowing that and knowing that the swivel casters really weren't going to play much of an impact on the ergonomics, we really focused on trying to expand the middle wheels, the rigid wheels here in the <laughs> center, and use that principle of wider is better to reduce that, that contact patch. And then in this case, you still gotta be able to rotate it. So then we went to a split wheel design across the middle of this, and we were able to reduce that push force down to 40 pounds. So they went from four people to now they had one person moving these things around just by improving their center wheel. Well. So next one, this was a cassette cart, uh, 1900 pounds. This was a diamond style, but all the casters were in contact. So in this case, they had, a, it was 80 pounds to get this to start moving. And they'd had multiple injuries reported at multiple facilities. So in this case, since the swivels are touching the ground, we know we have to address those. So in this case, go into a, a maintenance-free swivel section with the high precision, the high hardness, um, and then looking at the wheel material. So in this case, um, it was also a pretty abusive application. So in the slide before, you see this green urethane. So this green urethane is the most ergonomic, has super high rebound. Uh, it's just not as tough. In this case, we had to go to a, a different urethane that was slightly harder with really high toughness. So we gave up a little <laughs> bit on the, the rollability for better toughness, uh, but combined with the, the swivel section, we were still able to get that push force down to 35 pounds. And that they've been using these now for seven years and they haven't had any injuries since. So again, using the principles of better swivel section construction, better tread material, and we're able to make a large impact on, on the ergonomics. So what I really want people to take away from this is, you know, there, there really isn't one solution out there for every single application. 
<laughs> if you have a material handling issue where you know you're struggling to move something, there's a lot of different ways to go about solving it. And really, it starts with the right caster, getting the right soil section design, something that's very precise, uh, has good wear properties because it's heat treated to the right specs, has the optimized swivel lead. You know, looking at your wheel design, you want to make sure you're going to the largest diameter you can. And then, you know, look at that width. I mean, if, if you're just going in straight lines, wider is better. Otherwise, you might want to consider a split wheel design. And then with that Goldilocks principle with the, the tread material, finding that right balance of, of rollability and toughness, you know, that doesn't destroy other things in the facility. And then just putting them on the cart in the way that's best going to suit your operation. So that, that's all I had. And, um, you know, if you're working on a material handling uh, application where you're designing a new cart, these are the things that you should be asking questions about. Um, and when you do, you should be able to get some sort of testing data. Like we have a huge database of, of tests that we've run where if you say, hey, I need to move 3,500 pounds, we can say these are the five or six things that we've tested that we know work. And it's usually some combination of what I've talked about in this presentation. So that is what I have. So th thanks for um, listening and, and sharing in uh, my passion of, of casters. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, we will let the panelists ask a few more questions and and uh, yeah, get those answered. Steve, right. I think you had your hand raised. Steve, did you have your hand raised? Uh, I was, I was, I think Sir just submitted a question, Sir. Oh, yeah, he honest. said, he said, uh, are the loads rated per caster or per four or five casters? So a caster will have an individual caster rating, load rating. Um, but when we're looking at ergonomics, we're talking about total loads. So okay. In this case, like um, for the 4,500 pound application, I mean, each one of those wheels was rated for, I wanna say like 4,200 pounds. So there's a lot of safety factor built into it. But when you're talking about rollability, you, you have to go kind of above what the load rating is to be able to get the best rollability. So that's also a mistake that people make a lot too is, they say, hey, I have a 2,000 pound application. I'm gonna get a caster that you know, carries 500 pounds because I'm gonna assume everything's evenly loaded. And then I end up buying something kind of small and chintzy and I put it on there and then it doesn't work the way I want it to work. So the first thing you should be doing is dividing that load by three because three points make a plane and no floor is perfect. No you know, welded frame is perfect. So even those fours on there, really only three are going to be touching at any given time. But then that's where, you know, when trying to find a solution for a specific weight in terms of rollability, that's where you have to rely on uh, the, some of the test data to show how things work at different loads. Yes, sir. Thank you. I, I had... Uh... I have a question, uh, and it's kind of a, a two-fold. Uh, I was going to see if I could get Greg Pitts to jump in on this because he's he's kind of a expert on cost of injuries and stuff. You were talking about a seven-year investment, uh, and I'm just curious as to what something like that costs. And then I was going to see, you know, Greg, what you know, back injuries, shoulder injuries, those kind of things. If you don't mind, chime in and. Uh, sure. Because people don't understand the ROI behind your know, casters are cheap compared to Greg. Take it from there, please. Yeah, I mean, you know, your shoulder injury is going to cost you eighty to hundred thousand a pop, and your uh, back's going to be a hundred plus, maybe one hundred twenty plus, easy. And um, so it's it's the 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 end, the, the, end, the end result of design. If you can prevent one back injury, it's going to say not 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 to mention just the efficiency of the work. 
you're going to speed the work up, make it more safe. I had a question and, and, and I listened to you talk. It's very interesting. Um, do, do you actually help the consumer, the vendor, uh, talk about where you place the, the, the point of contact for the employee, the height, the type of handle? Do you help them make that decision as well? Because I would think that would impact also impact the injury rate uh, as it as it impacts you know impacts the back and how it impact and I I missed I'm sorry I missed the first part of your your conversation you may have covered that but that that's a big portion that kind of coexists with the caster I would think the the total package. Yeah, usually we leave that to to the the customer with their cart design because they'll have internal standards on how high the the handle needs to be. And then the cart manufacturer would make it to their to their standard. But to your point, even in those Liberty hand or Liberty Mutual uh, material handling tables, you can plug in different handle heights, and it'll give you different risk yes. based on the the handle height you put in too. Yes. And and you know I've been around a lot of companies, and, and I, I do a lot with a real big company that that's just like super ergonomics, and they do everything top shelf. But then there's vendors that supply the super animal that that has no standards <laughs> you yep. know what I'm saying and so that's why I'm, you know as we get to see we see both ends of the spectrum and they have no concept of what where a handle should be or 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 what type of handle it should be or you know you know what I'm saying it's it, 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 just all over the place and so that's why I was just I was just curious if, if you if you help if somebody asks you can you help them with that I guess the question uh yeah we I mean we would have the knowledge to be able to help them with that Perfect. You don't mind, Doug, I'll, I'll add to that. Um, e even if the carts are already pre-designed when they get there, they do a lot of, and, and I'm speaking from experience, they do a lot of work with you. If it's it's not just the caster, sometimes it's the width of the base plate that's going on there to help center the load, uh, you know, taking measurements. They're asking the, the, the great questions that they ask that you wouldn't always consider, um, Doug alluded to earlier, is, is the unbalanced load of the cart? They're saying, hey, is at any point, is this transported with all the load to the left, all the load to the right? So they, all those uh, variables are taken into consideration when choosing the, the caster for the cart. So that has always been extremely helpful because you know, a lot of times you walk in, that cart's already designed, you're kind of stuck with it, but you know that, uh, that it's, it's more to it than just a wheel. Mm -hmm. Hey, Doug, I got a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Sure. It's specifically around your, your or how do you say it, Twergo? Twergo, yeah. I think that is honestly a phenomenal concept. And is each one of the individual stack wheels independent of the other stack wheel stack with its own bearing? Yeah. So that they can all spin independently? Yep, yep. Because, you know, you think of um, when you were talking about, you know, a flat caster and how the inside and outside want to turn. <laughs> I assume that offset works in the favor of being easier to manipulate and twist right yeah yep do you ever find that because you have the channels between each one of the independent casters that sometimes it picks up more debris or because of them being able to rotate independently it kind of offsets it and it's better for maybe an offset floor or a rougher floor with a lot of debris on it Sure. So we, we do get that comment a lot from people that have not used split wheels or twergos. Um, so they're like, well, won't stuff just get stuck in between? I, I'd be lying if I said it never happens, but it, it happens very, very infrequently. And what we actually find is, you kind of alluded to it, is because the discs can spin independently, if something does get stuck, it works itself out. That's what I assumed too. And I thought that was one of the most brilliant things about it. You know, if you're working in a dirty shop and they don't have a perfectly laid floor, you know, it even helps going over cracks or uneven floor surfaces, something like that. My other question kind of pertains to your actual swivel sections. Yeah. Um, I saw on your site, you guys have a dual swivel section yeah. part you can go into and you didn't touch on that too much. Do you ever find that people you know, with something like that, I would assume, you know, you, your friction is very, very low. People think that it's sometimes hard to control. Um, so you'd be referring to what, what we call swivel on swivel. So it'd be uh, two swivel sections stacked and then offset. And 
from an ergonomic standpoint, it does help if you're trying to go 90 degrees with a cart. So say somehow you're, you, like normally the cart gets dropped off and then the swivel casters are pointed at 90 degrees instead of in line or at 180. So having that second degree of freedom actually allows you to get a little momentum going to break that 90 degree state because that is the most difficult one to get moving, but it's also very rare. So it, it does have some benefit to ergonomics, but where we really use the, the swivel on swivel is more in powered applications. Because so like an AGV. Like an AGV, because it increases maneuverability. And one of the maneuvers that's really tough to do with casters is you're going in a straight line, you stop, right. and then you reverse. Those casters swivel around, they fight each other, they add extra drag to the motor. And one, you got to oversize the motor, you use more power. Whereas if you have a, a dual swivel section or swivel on swivel, you really reduce that castering effect and can move, you know, do that maneuver, that stop, reverse with much less power. Got it. Yeah, I didn't even think about a powered application. But no, that's that's pretty much all I got. I think those uh those Twergo casters are just insanely cool, honestly. Yeah, you know, but I think we came out with ours in twenty fourteen or so. Uh, maybe 2012, and before that, the entire industry was either the the flat treads or the round treads. Right. And now it's probably 50% split wheels, if not more. Is your green color a component of material, or yes. can you put different material on those? So the the green is a certain type of urethane that we use. So it's it's it has the highest rebound, so it has the best rollability. Um, and I'd say it has like medium toughness. And then we have other urethanes that have lower rollability, but higher toughness. So then it just depends on the application, how abusive it is on what urethane we want to use. That's all I got. No, I appreciate it, man. All right, great. Thanks, Zach. Got a question for you, Doug. Um, as technology continues to expand and we see more and more automated um products in in the environment and i see a lot of them um mm -hmm. where is it going to be in the future is there going to be sensors in the wheels sensors in the the cast or sensor in the 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 stem that's on that can that can sense how fast they're moving what they're doing is, is that is that you're working on i'm assuming you probably probably work on something like that now because i see so much happening and i can see it becoming almost totally automated and and i'm just curious where where, where you see the future going with this, yeah, I mean, cer certainly with it's with more more automation. You know, I mean, just with the the rise of automated guided vehicles, I mean, the last five years has been incredible. Mm -hmm. um, again, that goes back to the labor shortage. You don't have people to tug stuff around facilities, so now we got to find a way to automate it. Um, a, a lot of those systems do have built-in sensors to track. And this, I mean, caster position isn't necessarily important, but it will track uh, like speed and stuff like that. You know, we've um, we've been doing powered systems for probably six or seven years now, and you know, we don't do anything totally autonomous. There's they're still uh, human operated, but we have some omnidirectional systems where the casters mm -hmm. have to monitor what position they're in because that's how they do the omnidirectional steering is they all move into the correct position as you're trying to steer it where you need to steer it. Got so it. yes, there, there's been a large increase in the number of sensors and everything else that you have to use to do that. Awesome. We have any more questions from the panelists? Just check. What is the impact of a dirty environment with oils? How do you handle different types of chemicals? And does your casters, the, the different ones act with different chemicals, oil versus, you know, kerosene versus gas, you know, what is that? I'm just curious. Yep. So in those situations where we know there's um, substances like that on the floor that the, the wheel's going to come in contact with, We'll gather that information, then we work with our urethane supplier to figure out what's the optimal material 
that's going to best withstand you know those chemicals awesome thank you yeah Sweet. Well, if we don't have any more questions, I'll go ahead and share my screen. And we'll uh, turn it over to Steve to give us a few last words. And once again, Doug, thank you so much for this presentation. And we're going to get it recorded and sent out to hundreds of people. Great. Yeah, thanks for having me. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, yeah thank you, Ray. Ray is our... Uh... He's our mission controller, and uh, I. But I, what I really wanted to say is thank you to all of you. Uh, you know, we committed to this uh, process of educating people, and it's uh, it's free. You know, you 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 go take a look at it. <clears throat> but just a little bit about the you know my my passion with casters is uh, again I work in a couple of different areas, but, you know, I see more misapplications of casters and it's from, uh, you know, I'll go grab a, four casters out of a bin at the hardware store or, you know, I, it, there's just no, no rhyme to it. And then, you know, again, like I mentioned, you know, we're putting down this, it's going to be a beautiful floor. These epoxy floors are beautiful and they're, and they're designed for specific things. And, you know, you, you look at them, um, and when we we started looking at this, I worked with a uh, another construction ergonomist. Uh, his name's Noble King. He's he's super good. And when we looked at doing this, uh, I was looking at the different organizations, and I was like, we don't want to build a we don't want to build a, a caster training program. That's not what we do. We uh, I, I put up a little posting out about my, my mom and making. Uh, biscuits and you know you, you, the people that do what they do so we uh we reached out to uh caster uh concepts for a reason they've got strong engineering they've got uh lots of years of engineering and when uh, we had our meeting conference everything we've done to to put this together they've been super reactive they they operate like a wing company and uh so Doug, I can't thank you enough, and Tyler George, you you too. I uh, you we've moved through the process quick, so um, thank you uh, on behalf of the organizers. And uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, we're and, happy to do it. Yeah, and our panelists, uh, you know, you you've all uh, committed to to being with us and sharing, and uh, that that's what we want to do, and that's what we need to do as a as an ergo community is 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 do that and i love that you know when you look at the cost of one injury and you've had a you know a solution in place you built a solution out with the company seven years ago you know it's it's kind of hard to measure what didn't hit you but all it took was one of those and uh you know you you saw that problem so that that's what we're trying to do is we want to uh we we want to help be part of the solution i hope that somebody sees something um, the other thing is we have no financial arrangement with caster uh, concepts. They, you know, they're we're two independent companies. We just ask them for help, and they uh, they extended their hand. So we're not here to sell you casters. But I will say this: if you uh, if if you are looking for solutions, uh, I would. That's who I would contact today. Uh, Doug is he I think he had his contact information up and he's also on LinkedIn or you can search their company caster concepts on LinkedIn and uh, they're doing a lot of cool stuff so um, our sponsors we call them our sponsors because uh, these are companies that we love and we have a uh, do a lot of work with uh, but they don't pay us anything so this is I mean this is genuinely free um, we uh, we love super feet and they they're a great company they're uh trim to fit orthotic and uh you know it's it's all about your posture uh commonwealth hand therapy that's dr pitts's company he's got multiple uh pt and ot uh outpatient clinics scattered throughout the bluegrass the beautiful bluegrass state of kentucky uh ergo algo office is our uh lean product that we use to uh to evaluate uh processes 
uh, Atomic Ergos, our podcast, we've done 17 this year. We we have 17 podcasts. And if you want to know what the uh, what the future of ergonomics looks like, the the people that we've interviewed have give us uh, a good peek into you know what we need to be doing. Uh, Ohm seating is a great product. Uh, we love them. And uh, when the the chair hits your door, uh, you can literally have it assembled by yourself within five minutes. Um, of course, Caster Concepts. Again, thank you. We'll, uh, you know, we look forward to having an opportunity to work with you. But I would say to every company out there that's doing ergonomics, they uh, they're an open door. So uh, we, uh, you know, reach out. And then uh, this is Kirby Mask. This is his consulting firm. Kirby's a CPE works with us, and uh, we we love Kirby and. Uh, if you if you want some super heavyweight uh, ergonomics, Kirby's Kirby's your guy. Um, so and then I Health three hundred and sixty. That's a friend of ours, Lanisha, uh, and she's got a up and coming company. So that, that's all I got. I, I just can't express enough gratitude. Happy holiday to you, whatever you want to call that. Uh, but uh, you know, I hope everybody has a safe safe holiday and I hope that 2024 that we you know we're all sharing uh, the blessings that that have been bestowed upon us so that's all I have and and please speak up uh, if you know you want to want to share something with us and if not then we'll we'll call it a night Merry Christmas everyone yeah, Merry Christmas, Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank, thank you do, yep, thank hey, do, we have, do we have a quick story I'll share if you guys so yeah, have a minute. Uh, just talking about the importance of casters, the, the whole world of ergonomics revolves around people, right? Sure, there's a science, but at the end of the day, it's about people and taking care of people. And uh, my former employer, we had four different cart designs, which was over 500 carts. All four of these designs range from anywhere from 85 pounds of push fours up to 120 pounds of push fours. We had females that were trying to move this that didn't weigh that much. Yeah. And, and uh, had... Um, and, and it was caster concepts that came in and, and helped me uh, find a good caster. The Twergo caster is what we put on there. And when we had these in uh, trial mode uh, on this particular cart, every morning I'd go by and talk to the operators and I'd say, hey, how do you like those new casters? And every time I'd ask, they would smile real big and, oh, we love them. Oh, thank you. You know, it's so nice not to go home hurting. The shoulders are not sore. You know, and I'm, you know, just kind of walking around my chest stuck out thinking, oh, yeah, good, big win. <laughs> I came by one morning, I asked a gentleman, I said, hey, man, how do you like the, the casters on the cart there? He said, I hate them. And I said, you hate them? I said, what do you mean you hate them? He said, let me show you. And he grabs the, the cart with the, the, the twergos on it, and then he starts pushing it over to the stationary location where they're, they're, they're stored very easy. And I'm like, what's this guy talking about, you know? He pushes the cart against the wall, turns around, walks about five feet toward me, stops. And I was like, what's the problem? He said, the cart's following me, isn't it? And I turned around and looked, and sure enough, the cart was actually rolling behind him. And the <laughs> casters worked so well that it wouldn't stay still. It went from hard to move. I can't move the cart. To, I can't keep it still. We actually had to put bump tape down because the floors weren't level to keep those carts from from just rolling on their own. So it was a uh, it was it was a good uh, good experience. Oh well, yeah, perfect story. It's amazing hey, we we don't think about the the fatigue factor. And you know, if you're if you're working at a a, a voluntary effort of 70, 80, 90 percent of what you can do, and you reduce that way down, and you go home at night, you've got energy to do other things. Yeah. If you're working your hind end off during the day, and that's that's the difference. It's not just the injury, it's also the fatigue factor that Absolutely. plays a big role in quality of life. The morale, big time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for sharing that, Dale. Yeah, appreciate the, appreciate the opportunity to be on the panel tonight. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Dale. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, we appreciate you, and we hope you want to work with us in the future. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Yeah. Have a good night, guys. Thank you. Yep. Bye. 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 Good night.